Hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, and I'm the host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. For those of you that are new to us, um, I just want to give you a little background about who the heck we are and why we do what we do. Um, bottom line, Alzheimer Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort worldwide. And we believe the only way we can really do that is to join forces and share knowledge and have everyday conversations about life with dementia so that we can remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help those diagnosed with this disease continue to live with purpose. Um, At our core, we believe that collaboratively is really the only way that we are going to be able to um, win this battle. And I know it's working because of all of your likes and clicks and shares Um, It's just had a huge, huge impact on us, and um, we were lucky enough to be named the number one influencer, according to Dr. Oz and ShareCare, and that happened only because of you. So I just want to give you a big thanks and reaching out, giving you a big hug out there. So thank you so much. Um, Some of you might be interested in also being on the show. We listen to everybody's voice, so If you are a person living with dementia, maybe you're caring for a loved one or a friend, maybe you're a professional, an author, um, you might be a movie director, researcher, um, coming up with a a new technology, give me a holler. You can uh, contact me by phone or by email and just go to alzheimerspeaks.com and from there uh, click on the big contact button. And we will be off and running. And um, I look forward to to speaking with you and hearing what your story is. Now, before we get started, um, I'm just going to give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors here. uh, um, GoFreshBooks.com forward slash alive. Uh, You can get a free 30-day trial of Fresh Books, which is just an accounting system. If you're like me, you need a little help uh, getting organized. Um, Check out your free 30-day trial. Again, you can go to gofreshbooks.com forward slash alive. We have another um, free free offer for you with Audible. And uh, there you can download an Audible book, um, again, free of charge, for 30 days. And you can do that through audibletrial.com forward slash social audible trial dot com forward slash social. So let's get into um, our talk today. We're going to be talking about kind of removing the doom and gloom from dementia with two wonderful people who we've had on the show before. We've been very um, lucky to to hear their wisdom and I'm, I'm so excited to have both Tom and Karen Brenner with us. They are educators, consultants, and writers in the field of dementia. And for the past 20 years, the Brenners have been able to apply the Montessori method to connect people living with dementia in long-term care homes and adult day programs and memory clinics throughout the U.S. Um, They've written a book, which is called You Say Goodbye and We Say Hello, the Montessori Method for Positive Dementia Care. And it's available on Amazon. You can get it in Barnes & Noble, and it's also a Kindle e-book, so um, go out and grab that book. Um, you say goodbye and we say hello. So welcome, Tom. How are you today? Is he there? I don't know. I, we might have lost him. Might have lost him. Um, he said he was in a secure area, so it might be a little more secure than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> can he go, Can he call back in or can you call him? Yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead and try to get them on the line here. Okay, but I'm here. Well, welcome, Karen. Like I said, we are thrilled to have you. Um, Why Mm -hmm. don't we go ahead and um, get started? And I always like to uh, let our audience know um, a little bit about you first. 
Have you ever been personally touched by dementia with family or friends? Yes. Uh, my, yes, my mother had vascular dementia toward the end of her life. And um, she died of a, of, a, of a brain aneurysm, so she only had the, um, uh, the dementia, I would say, just about a year. I think that was my really first introduction uh, to dementia. And I have to admit, Lori, that when Tom and I started this work, I, I, I was a teacher, and Tom is the gerontologist. So I was very frightened of people who had dementia. It, it, it was very disturbing to see what happened with my mom, and I had no tools at that time to know how to, how to be with her. And uh, so I was really frightened by this whole notion of working with people who had dementia. And, and that's, how I, that's how I started. And, of course, Tom is the gerontologist, and uh, he was doing a lot of research into different methods of caregiving. And he happened to stumble upon uh, Dr. Cameron Camp, who was using the Montessori method for people with dementia. And I, I've been a, I was a Montessori educator for over 30 years. Uh, the last 20 of those years, I worked with children who were deaf and used the Montessori method with uh, children who could not hear. So I had some preparation in dealing with people who had a hard time communicating. And uh, I had no idea that my monastery training, my experience working with children who are deaf would one day lead to Tom and I working together. We used to laugh because I worked with very young children and he worked with, of course, elderly people. So we were at different ends of the spectrum and it's been wonderful uh, being able to work together. Oh, that's wonderful. We're going to try to get Tom on the line here. Okay. And um, with our system here, we might hear a little ding, ding, ding as he's ringing them up. So <clears throat> we'll just be a little patient um, with that. But um, as, as... He's worth it. He's worth it. Yeah, I think so, too. I think so, too. Um, Lord, is there an echo when I'm talking? Because I hear an echo, but you don't hear an echo. N nope, I'm not hearing an echo at all at oh, our good. end. So, good. Um, yeah. hey, there he is. Hey, Tom, we lost you there. Uh, I'm trying to get to a better place, so if, if you bear with Aren't me. Aren't we all trying, trying to get to a better place? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to get philosophical, but the, the shoe fits. <laughs> Tom, I'll just catch you up. I was talking to Lori and her audience about how uh, we started, and I was a Montessori teacher. You were the gerontologist, and you found Cameron Camp and his work, and how I was really very reluctant to try this. I was pretty afraid. And you mm -hmm. kind of, you talked me into it. You sort of twisted my arm. And it's been a blessing ever since. You gave her the nudge, huh? Mm-hmm. Are you there? Oh, we might have lost him again. Well, we'll oh, see. my gosh. Well, we'll just we'll just keep our conversation <laughs> going, and we'll try calling him in again. Okay, I'm so sorry, Lori. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the building works in is is... Like you said, it's very secure, and it has some odd little quirks. Yep. No, that's that's not a problem. Why don't you talk uh, to us about what is your central theme or approach to dementia care? I know, you know, we're talking about your, your the Montessori approach and stuff, but a lot of people probably don't even know what the heck that means. Yeah. You know, it was interesting in the introduction to your program, Lori, that you said that one of your goals for Alzheimer's Speaks is to kind of disabuse people of all this doom and gloom around dementia and Alzheimer's. And boy, we're on the exact same page with you on that. Uh, that is one of our main missions. Uh, you know, um, when people first get the diagnosis of dementia, the doctor usually uh, gives them two prescriptions. One is for Aricep or one of the colonase inhibitors. And and the other prescription is to go home and get their affairs in order. And usually that's all they get. And what a frightening thing to have to deal with. You know, suddenly your whole world is turned upside down. So what Tom and I want to do for people, both people who are living with dementia and their caregivers, is to give them some hope, some real practical help, and uh, some understanding that, yes, their lives are going to be very different now, but their life is not over, and neither is the life over 
of the person who has dementia. So I guess our central theme is that, you know, dementia is not the long goodbye. Mm -hmm. It is a different way of being with someone. As I mentioned earlier, I had no clue how to be with my mother, who had always been a very dynamic, sharp, as attack, a very leader, very a sort of alpha personality. And to see her uh, fail, it was frightening, as it is for so many people. And sadly, I didn't have the tools I needed then, but I do now, and this is what we want to share. So I guess to kind of sum up, our central approach is that we want people to understand that it's going to be difficult, the journey, and there's going to be moments of desperation and moments of great sadness, but there's also going to be moments of very deep connection, of uh, laughter. A lot of that's what shocked me how much laughing there is when you work with people with dementia. There's a lot of laughter, so there's joy, and there's this um, deep, deep love because people with dementia have no agenda. And they live in this moment. And if we can teach ourselves to do that, to live in this moment and be with them wherever they are, then that opens us up to really joining them on the dementia journey. So that's our central approach is that we want to be positive. We want to look for those moments of connection, however brief they are. And we want to to recognize that uh, dementia is not uh, the long goodbye it's a new way to say hello. Yeah, I I totally am in line with that. In fact, uh, today on Dementia Chats, and I <clears throat> I don't have the recording edited and put out yet, but we we talked about um, actually w- with our experts who all have um, younger onset um, disease um, mm-hmm. about what it's like to be recorded and filmed, and w- you know what do they want to get out? And one of their primary messages was. You know, our life isn't all that much different. You know, we, mm-hmm. we do things differently. But mm-hmm. in the big scheme of things, you know, we still eat and sleep and get dressed and get together with friends and we laugh and we cry and we have all the same mm-hmm. emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It, it, it's just a little different, you know, but there is a lot of good life um, left once diagnosis takes place. That is wonderful that you're doing that and you're getting that message out there. And I know, reading about your background, that you... Uh, care for your mother who has dementia and um, so you know up close and personal what it's like yeah my mom had it for 30 years so more than half of my life oh my gosh how about that and I always tell people that you know if we would have listened to the doctor's instructions like you said you know go home and prepare to die basically and and take your and take your pill you know (laughs) then then we would have we would have missed out on an awful lot of life and, I know. And that know. And what, is so sad. Yeah. So sad. Um, mm-hmm. But there's there's so much that we can learn. Um, why, don't, uh, why don't we go in and talk a little bit more about um, the Montessori method and okay. how it's been designed for children, but it can be really helpful for adults with dementia as well. Okay, just very briefly, uh, for those people who don't know much about the name Montessori, Dr. Maria Montessori was the first woman to become a physician in Italy, and this was in the uh, late or early 1900s, about 1905. And um, her first assignment was to care for the inmates and the children of the inmates of the in insane asylum in Rome. And these children were uh, housed there with their parents, and they had no instruction and they had no stimulation. They weren't even allowed to go outside. And um, so Maria Montessori began to develop tools for these children to learn, something to do, use with their hands. And uh, from her work with the children in the insane asylum, she developed the beginnings of the Montessori method, which is based on muscle memory. And that is the memory that we use when we uh, remember how to um, use our muscles, like ride a bike or swim or even sing a song because, you know, we use our vocal cords, I mean, muscles. Uh, reading uh, is a muscle memory uh, work because our eyes move uh, back and forth when we read. So many things that we do every day is based on muscle memory. And fortunately, 
this muscle memory is the one that tends to be least affected by uh, dementia. Uh, of course, everyone is different. We know that. And every individual's journey is different. But in the main, uh, this sort of muscle memory is the one that is least affected. That's the memory that Tom and I tap into. And that's the memory system that Dr. Montessori tapped into. Dr. Montessori went on to set up a school in the slums of Rome and um, with very, very poor children. And she taught them how to take care of themselves and, you know, how to wash their hands, blow their nose. Uh, and how to take care of their environment, like uh, scrub a table, sweep a floor, prepare food. So you see now we're getting into some parallels here between uh, activities of daily living, ADLs, that uh, we are concerned about with people who have dementia. And that was also a big concern of Dr. Montessori. She wanted children to be able to take care of themselves and their environment. So you see, there are we're beginning to see some parallels here between the uh, so there's two, uh, the memory system mm -hmm. in both uh, care for children and care for our elders, and then the prepared environment, an environment that fits the needs of the people using it. Dr. Montessori was the person who invented uh, uh, child-sized furniture. Until her, until she came along kids just sat on adult furniture, but mm -hmm. she invented child size furniture. She also invented the first playground equipment, you know, uh, jungle gym, climbing, adirat, climbing apparatus, that sort of thing uh, for children. So she sort of ran the full gamut of the needs of children. And, uh, you know, in the best long-term care homes or, or memory enhancement centers or adult day centers, the very, very good ones are the ones when you walk in and you think you're in a really comfortable home. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like a hospital. It doesn't feel like a medical center. It feels like just a really nice home. And, and everything is designed for the comfort and ease of the people using it. That is a central tenet of the Montessori philosophy. And it is also a central tenet of really, really good uh, dementia care. So we have those parallels there. And then the last thing that is, there are many, many parallels, but in the interest of time, I'll just say the last thing that is so essential to the Montessori method and to good, positive dementia care is positive language. Dr. Montessori, uh, because she was a physician and a scientist and an, she had a PhD in anthropology as well, and so she learned by observing and she observed that it takes three positive to counter a negative. So instead of children saying to children, don't walk, she said, please run. Instead of saying to children, be quiet, she would, she would say, use your, please use your quiet voice. You, these things seem sort of cliche and kind of simple. I tell you what. You try using positive language all day in a room full of 30 children. <laughs> it, it's a challenge. I did it for many years. But you know what? Language is so powerful in all of our lives, and it really matters what we say and how we say it. And, and it's a beautiful gift that Dr. Montessori gave to us. And um, I'll just tell you a quick story. I was observing one time in a Montessori classroom, and I saw a a little girl, maybe six years old, who was really just awful. She was being terrible to the teacher. She was being terrible to her classmates. Her teacher bent down and said to her, you are too beautiful to behave this way. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and the little girl changed. Wow. Because she wanted to be her beautiful self. So it's so important to, you know, to say to people and to, use positive language with people who have dementia and to try to understand that you, they, uh, we know it's frustrating and aggravating and heartbreaking, but they don't mean to do those things to us. We know that intellectually. It's so important to try and remember it in our being. So one way that helps with that is to always use positive language, no negative. And then in the, in, in the light of this, one thing that Tom and I ask people to do, and this is extremely hard, but we still ask caregivers to try to do it. We ask them to lose the word remember, and that's real hard to do. We say remember so much in the course 
of a conversation. You know, oh, remember when that happened? Or remember so-and-so? We can't do that with someone who has dementia. It's like asking them to get up and fly around the room. It's very frustrating for them. And, of course, frustrating for us. So, so those are some things that we want caregivers to try. It's, you know, everything is a goal, right? Mm-hmm. Every day we get up, we're going to try again. And so this is, and we just have seen that it's, it makes such a difference in a family home or an intentional care home when the people living and working there speak positively to each other. So, so that. So, Karen, I have a question. So, instead mm-hmm. of saying "remember," what would be an alternative? Um, how how would you like people to phrase things that? Oh, that's a you know something. I don't think anybody's ever asked us that question. Let me see if I can think of <laughs> an answer. <laughs> I think it is we we try and ask uh, people with dement- dementia open ended questions. In other words, I wouldn't say to you if I was interacting with you and you had dementia, uh, Lori, how many years have you been married? I would probably say, because that would call on you to remember, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so I would probably say something like, boy, Lori, I've been married a long time, so have you. If there's a lot of ups and downs in marriage, you know, uh, and you know, or something like that. So we can have a conversation without me asking you to give, give me facts, like dates and times and and qualities uh, or qual- yeah qualifiers you know um we just want to keep the conversation sort of open ended so we don't ask people to remember um you know specific facts it's a technique you you have to practice it mm-hmm. like everything else and Tom and I we've been doing this so many years we still slip up you get you get involved in someone's conversation and you'll say, oh, when did that happen? You know, they're telling you about something that happened and you say, oh, when did that happen? Well, nope, wrong, because then you're asking them to remember when. So, uh, it, like I say, it's a goal mm-hmm. and we strive every day to remember these things. Okay, well that's that's good to uh, that's good to know those alternatives. I know um, Penny Gardner in the UK has kind of her um, ten tips and uh, yes. with the Contented Dementia Trust, and she has just a whole list of alternatives um, that's just kind of amazing because it's really easy to tell us not to do something, but we need to know how. And and, and like you said, and like she said. It takes a lot of practice. This isn't something yes. that we just do because we've kind of been brainwashed to criticize and to pull facts. And um, That's right. And so it's a very different type of, of conversation. Let's try to get Tom back on the line again. And Oh, I hope we can get him, that rascal. Yeah, well, you know, that's what happens when you work for a really secure company. You know? I know. <laughs> it's a department on aging. <laughs> it's not NASA. Well, you just never yeah. know. Hello. Hey, he's there. He's back again. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hello. hello. We, we thought we'd give you a while to be able to secure a, a, a better spot, so we'll see how this uh, works. So welcome back. With... Oh, go ahead. Lost him. We lost him again. Okay. Well. Oh, man. <laughs> well. I am so sorry because, you know, Tom, I know you've heard Tom speak, and he's, He's terrific and a lot of fun, and I am so sorry. Yeah, well, that's uh, apparently it's not meant to be, so it's going to test our, I've... it's going to test our speaking strategies here today. <laughs> I guess. So that, I think we can manage. I We're think, girls. I think we'll do just <laughs> fine. Why don't Why don't you share, Karen, with our audience why you say that dementia can be viewed as a new normal? Because you know that the doctors always say, you know, it's not dementia or it's not, it's not normal aging, you know, and why are you saying that it, it can be viewed as the new normal? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, Tom and I have to, we always give credit to two major forces in the, uh, the world in, in dementia research. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one of them is Dr. G. Allen Power. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the other is Dr. Peter Whitehouse. Mm-hmm. Dr. Whitehouse has written a, a book called The Myth of Alzheimer's, and uh, he, he's not only a, a geriatrician, a, a medical doctor, he's also uh, a Ph.D. and uh, teaches and does research at Case Western. And um, 
he and uh, and then Dr. Uh, Power also is a geriatrician, and a couple of his books are uh, Dementia Beyond Disease and Dementia Beyond Drugs. And mm-hmm. I, Tom and I highly recommend all of those books and and any of the writings of either Dr. Peter Whitehouse or Dr. Uh, G. Allen Power. Uh, so it was really Dr. Power who come up, came up with the phrase the new normal, and he he. He explains that just as you were saying, um, things are going to uh, uh, things are going to be different. Uh, but if you're living this life of dementia, it becomes normal to you, doesn't it? I mean, this is your life now. Either the person who has the condition, or the people who are caring for them. So this is your life, and uh, this is what you must deal with. So if you if you go around forever comparing how your life used to be. Or how you want your, how you would like your life to be, uh, that just leads to a lot of anger and sorrow and frustration. So we encourage people just to embrace. Okay, this is the way it is now. This is our new normal, and we're going to do the very best we can with it. Of course, much easier said <laughs> than done. The other thing that uh, Dr. Power uh, writes about is, um, you know how we have. Uh, our society, and, and rightly so, in the last few decades, has made a lot of accommodations for people with special needs. We have ramps for wheelchairs. A lot of theaters have um, uh, aids for people who don't hear well. And so we make these accommodations for people with special needs. So he, Dr. Power says he thinks we should come up and develop accommodation or ramps for people with dementia so that they can function as at the most productive level possible for them, both where they live and then out in the larger world. And, you know, um, I know that some people have little cards they carry, mm-hmm. and they will hand it to a clerk or a waitress or, you know, someone that they're dealing with who doesn't know them and say, I have dementia. So I'm, you know, and I, you know, I, I uh, things will be a little slower for me, or something like that. You know, so there's little things like that 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 we can do uh, to sort of make these accommodations for people who are living with dementia. And in doing that, we kind of accept that this is our life, and we're going to make the most of it. And by by creating these accommodations, uh, we're going to recognize that we're not fighting against this you know and you know it's easy isn't it and you must know this too Lori, being a primary caregiver it's easy to let your world get smaller and smaller isn't it oh yeah very easy. and and you kind of have to work at it don't you to to keep the larger world in sight and you know we say in our book um you say goodbye and we say hello that uh it it's it might be a little tough, but it's important to reach out to friends and say, you know, come on by and visit us. You know, no, my husband can't play cards anymore, but he would love to see you. We'll go for a walk or we'll listen to some music. You know, okay, you can't do what you did before, but you can still be uh, company. You can still visit. And, of course, people like a lot of people are like I was. They're afraid of dementia. And you have to sort of be the person, the liaison, who says to them, you know, Tom's different now, but he's still Tom. And, and we would both love to see it. It mean a lot to me. So we have to kind of be the ones who make that reach out. And I know that's tough to do sometimes, you know. Um, but we have to for our own good and for the good of people we care for. And that, too, is an accommodation. So if we think about living our life that way, making accommodations, and just accepting that, you know, we all of our lives we plan to go to Paris, but now we wound up in Holland, and you know, Paris would have been nice, but hey, Holland isn't so bad, mm-hmm. and you just accept where you are and try to move forward. Yeah, I I, I like that um, business about the new normal because it it says it's livable, mm-hmm. and and it, it's you know and it's allowable versus, you know, shoving this stuff in the closet and people feeling embarrassed and 
mm-hmm. uncomfortable. And um, and with the growing number of people, I mean, we're going to have to learn how to how to deal with this. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's not it's not going away. And no. um, so we have to learn how to live with it graciously. And it gives I think it gives permission to do that when we call mm-hmm. it when we call it a new normal. Um, just as and, you know, a, a lot of people need to learn this, not just family and professional caregivers, but first responders. And I say people who work in stores, people who work in restaurants. This is, you know, this is a life lesson for lots of people, because, as you say, the population is the baby boomers, this huge, you know, tidal wave of uh, elders coming down the pike. And um, so the larger world is going to have to learn how to do this and how to make these accommodations. And uh, so we might as well get started now, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about a term that, that you and Tom use called the storied or the stored uh, memory? It's the storied memory. You okay. said it right the first time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is something that uh, we did not expect to happen to us at all. And... Um, what we did was um, we would create stories uh, because uh, Tom and I want to keep people with dementia reading for as long as possible rather than being read to. Now, it's true. Some people with dementia simply can't read anymore. And okay, so then we'll read to them. But there are a lot of people whom you wouldn't think because of the, the way they, their, their effect, the way they seem, that they would be able to read. But if you give them something in a big enough print, large enough print so they can see it properly, a lot of people with dementia can still read. And this is a wonderful tool, reading, because there's so much fun to be had doing this. Um, I'm going to tell you a couple of examples. Uh, One example, uh, something that Tom and I created when we realized that a lot of people with dementia can still read, is that we would uh, make jokes. So we would put jokes on a large card in large print, and the setup would be on one side, and then you turn it over, and the punchline would be on the other side. And because of muscle memory that we talked about earlier, people with dementia, if you do this often enough with them, will remember to read the setup to the joke and then turn it over, and read the punchline. And I'll tell you the joke that kills in all of the nursing homes, adult day centers, memory clinics that Tom and I have been in in all of the United States, and here's the joke. The setup is, what did the bra say to the top hat? You turn it over, and the punchline is, you go on ahead, I'm going to give these two a lift. And it people scream with laughter. They love that. They love that joke. So they're just silly jokes like, what nationality is Santa Claus? And you turn it over, North Polish, things like that. And people laugh. And so they're reading, which is great. They're remembering to turn the card over, which is great. And they're sharing a laugh with their friend, the people in the, either, or their family. All right, that's one thing we do with reading. And then the other thing, and this is where the storied memory comes in to play, Tom and I would bring in short stories, like two, three, four, five pages long, again, in the large print. And we would do elder reading circles, and everybody would take a turn reading a page. And then we'd talk about what we had just read. When we were doing that, Lori, what we were shocked about, we didn't expect, people would start telling us stories from their own lives. Not long stories, just kind of like a snapshot, you know, a moment. Mm-hmm. And so then Tom and I started writing down those stories. And um, and then again, we'd put it in large print and put it in a binder and we'd use it in our elder reading stories. And here's what we found. <clears throat> the stories from elders had much more resonance and meaning than any kind of story that Tom and I could have put together. And what else is so great about this? We we have a we have a community of stories that stretches all over the United States because we would take a story that Esther told us in Chicago about uh, 
going through a vicious, bitter Chicago night to take flowers to her friend during the Depression, we would take that story from Chicago, and, and that story would go all over the United States. So, in other words, people living in, with dementia in various places in the United States are sharing each other's stories. And it's so, it's so meaningful to them. And that's where Tom and I learned that, you know, our memory is really in our stories. Just these snapshots, and, and as I'm sure you know and most of the audience knows, short-term memory in dementia is pretty much gone. But long-term memory can be still quite intact. And that's the memory we tap into. And it's wonderful. We have heard the most remarkable stories that people just, there was one woman, we were doing this, we were reading somebody else's story. And then she just popped up and said, I was a pinup girl in, the, in World War II. <laughs> and it turned out that one of the sailors who had her picture found her after the war and they got married oh, and they wow. they were married for I don't know, at that time 50 something years so just these amazing stories would come to Tom and I and then we would and another thing we did with the stories was we made video diaries and <clears throat> we as you were just talking about yourself we would film people telling the stories and then we would show them, show them the film, and then film them reacting to their stories. And that was a lot of fun because uh, they'd say, say things like, who is that old man? Well, how does he know all that about my life? Then they'd finally recognize themselves, and then they'd love hearing the story again. So we do video diaries, and then we, we, we recreate these stories in, um, in binders with large print and share them in – all sorts of homes, all sorts of places, and and then we have this tremendous community of stories. So that is something we did not know was going to happen, and that has been a tremendous blessing to us. We've heard so many tremendous, marvelous stories of courage and good humor and just grit, you know, getting through it. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> it's been an inspiration to us. I can tell you. And a lot of those stories are actually, that we heard are actually in our book. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And again, your book is called You Say Goodbye and We Say Hello, The Montessori Method for Positive Dementia Care. Um, Thank you for mentioning that. (laughs) And again, that's available on Amazon and Barnes Mm & Noble. And if you're a Kindle person, you can also get it in an e-book as well. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just a a wonderful, resourceful, and just kind of a fun read, too. Very uplifting book. Yeah, thank you, Laura. You know what, Tom and I, when we set out to write the book, what we wanted to do, and I, I think we accomplished it, we wanted to put a face on dementia. We wanted to give a narrative to it. You know, uh, uh, tell the story of it, um, and and I think we did that. And and so many wonderful people were so generous to share their stories that we then put in the book. And uh, of course, you know, we respected their privacy, and we don't use real names or real situations, um, and you know, to be ethical. Uh, but there's no one can tell the story of living with dementia like a person who is in fact living with dementia. And that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to get their stories out mm-hmm. in the world. Yeah, which is very much needed. And that's one of the reasons I started Dementia Chats and, and even the radio, because we interview a lot of people with dementia as well. And um, mm-hmm. I and, know you do. And the blog, um, we love mm-hmm. getting their stories and their articles. Um, it's just mm-hmm. they, are, <clears throat> they are the best teachers. I mean, they're, they're living and breathing the disease, and they have wonderful insights and you know, they really need to be involved in all aspects of a cure and social supports. Um, because You are so right. That is everything you just said was absolutely right. Well, that's good. That's my one thing for today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can go on now. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> we all need we all need that. Um, but it's just it's so important for all of us to be heard, you know, if we have dementia or yes. not. Um but Whenever we are dealing with a, a cause, I mean, to me, it's just foolish if we're not, if we're not embracing um, the true 
you know, cause before us. Mm-hmm. If we're really not mm-hmm. asking and engaging them, it's um, we're really almost wasting our time um, because we're going down That's the right. wrong path a lot of times um, with misconceptions that could be cleared up quite easily and quite cost effectively if we would just yeah. take the time. You're right, and I'm going to tell you a real quick story that if Tom was on the phone, and I'm so sorry he's not with us, he would tell this story. He was one time part of a a group that was hiring, uh, I think, an activity director. And at this particular um, care home, which was really uh, sort of cutting edge and, and really right on the money, and so they brought in a person who has dementia who who would in fact be live who would in fact be interacting with this activity director. So the person with dementia was part of the hiring group. Mm-hmm. Isn't that an interesting idea? And so they interviewed several they interviewed this person and then the person left and the, the group was talking the pros and cons of this person. And then the person with dementia spoke up and said, Don't hire her and they said, Why? And he and, she, and the and he said she didn't make eye contact with any of you, and she didn't uncross her arms. Mm-hmm. See, he was looking at the body language, and they were listening to the words. Yep. And he saw, he saw that she had trouble connecting with people, and he knew that's not going to work for dementia people with dementia. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting, and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and again, it's just looking at the world in a whole different light mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, and taking mm-hmm. the time to to read all of the communications, not just the lips that are, you know, um, making noises before us. And stuff. <laughs> That's right. So, um, yeah, very, very important. Um, I wanted to ask you also um, why you feel it's essential to put something meaningful into the actual hands of somebody with dementia. And, and thank you for bring, the, thank you for bringing that up. If if people who are listening today don't remember anything from this talk, I hope they will remember this because this is essential to connecting and and being able to build a relationship with someone with dementia. And it's so simple, and it is just as you said, put something meaningful in a person's hand. Okay, what is meaningful? Um, um, well, let's say, for example, a guy was a, um, CPA. So someone might think, oh, well, we'll give him ledger books or we'll give him a calculator. Well, you know what? Maybe he didn't like being a CPA. He did it because that's how he made his living. But what, you know, what he really, really liked, he loved baseball. That's what he was passionate about. So someone who really knows this guy would know that. So if you bring in a baseball mitt and let him hold it or a baseball or a pennant. Uh, Tom says he, he always remembers the smell of the wool pennant because he collected pennants when he was a boy. And even today, if he holds a pennant and smells the wool pennant, it, it, it takes him back to his childhood. So just something like that. So you give him something meaningful to hold, and then you will be amazed at what comes forth. Because people who have dementia, it's really hard to start a conversation out of thin air uh, as an abstraction. So we give them something concrete. If you don't know them well enough to give them something meaningful, you can get something from nature, a flower, some herbs. We use a lot of fresh herbs in our work, a cup of snow, some autumn leaves, anything like that. Um, Something made of wood because we all... uh, our, even people that grow up in the city, we all have this special bond with nature. And uh, that's another way to kind of light people up is to give them something from nature to interact with. And what we're doing here is we're, we're getting people to interact with something through their hands. And when they do that, that sort of frees them up to, to talk about who knows what, um, Tom, again, Tom would tell this story. He tells it better than I do. He, Tom does a lot of work coming up with exercises for men. And one of the things he came up with was polishing hubcaps with, of course, polish that is non-toxic. Mm-hmm. He found some antique hub, hubcaps in a, one of those uh, automobile graveyards. It, I, it cost almost nothing. But, you know, like a Studebaker and some of these cars that are no longer around. And, 
And uh, so he has this exercise where he has someone if they'd like to polish some hubcaps with him. And, of course, in our approach, if someone says no, no is no, and that's okay. But a lot of times if you start doing it, even though they said no, they'll start watching you, and then they'll want to join, or at least they'll watch. So Tom was polishing hubcaps with this fellow, Bob, and he, as you had mentioned earlier, was a man who had early onset. He was in his early 50s. And they were polishing hubcaps together, and Bob was pretty silent. He, the staff told us he, 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 he rarely says anything. And then all of a sudden, when Bob was polishing the hubcaps, he started talking about his time in Vietnam. And Tom was floored. But then he realized it was that polishing movement, because, you know, when you're a soldier, you have to polish your boots, you have to polish your brass, you have to polish your gun. There's a lot of that polishing that goes on. And Tom says, you know, if I had walked up to him and said, Bob, I understand you were in Vietnam. Uh, let's talk about it. He would have gotten nowhere. But Bob just suddenly started talking about the DMZ and DMZ, and he was sharing these memories of his time in the war because of the polishing motion. So we've seen some remarkable breakthroughs, and, and I hope people will think about that uh, when they're – trying to connect with someone with dementia, uh, you put something meaningful in their hand to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, you know, it's just a nice reminder for family and friends in terms of how to engage and try to ease the process because sometimes people are so stressful on how do I engage and yes. you know, if you can bring a photo or if you can bring, um, you know, something tactile for them to, to touch and yes. feel and reminisce. Um, it, yes. It's just easier for for all of you, mm -hmm. you know, in mm -hmm. that process. So, yeah, yeah, good, 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 good thought. Um, anything else that you would like to share with our audience today, uh, Karen? Well, yeah, um, you know, one of the things that Tom and I are most pleased about is that we're noticing through different books that are published, articles that are published, and talks that are given that it seems like the conversation around dementia is beginning to change. And, and this is sort of where we began our conversation today, Lori, with you saying, you know, we want to sort of end the doom and gloom mm -hmm. uh, in your introduction. And that's what we're so pleased about because we're hearing a lot of people who work in the field saying, you know, let's look for those moments of connection. Let's look for those little tiny steps of victory. Uh, let's give people an opportunity to be generative again, people with dementia. Let's give them a chance to tell their stories or to read to a child or to work in the garden. Uh, let's open up the world to them as much as we can and let's make accommodation for them. And let's don't treat them like, you know, it's, we're just marking time until the end. Let's let's make the most of these precious days together. And as frustrating and heartbreaking as dementia can be, and we know it is, mm -hmm. there are also these these little moments, just these flashes of moments of beauty, of joy, of love, and uh, that's you know what we want to really encourage people to look for. So Tom and I, when we hear people talking in the field like you and I are talking, Lori, it just warms our heart. Because, you know, if, you, if you're depressed and hopeless and full of despair, nothing much good is going to come of that, is it? No, no. It's a, yeah. it's a really lonely place to be, that's for sure. It is. Yeah. And, and we've all been there from time to time, and, and that's part of life. We recognize that. But, you know, love is a verb. And when you love someone and you care for them, it's about doing not for them, but doing with them and being with them. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that in our book, you say goodbye and we say hello. We, we, we show people how to, because again, back to the beginning of the conversation, I didn't know how to be with my mother. Mm -hmm. I, I just didn't know how to be anymore. And so our book talks a lot about how to do that, how to be in relationship and, and find those connections with somebody who has dementia. 
Well, and that's, a, I think, a real important piece that, that you're right. We don't know how. We don't know how to do this. And um, the more we can share stories with one another, the easier it's going to be for the next guy um, to be able to do better than what we did and not feel so isolated and alone and scared in this process. That's right. You know, I'm a, if, if you don't mind, Marie, I'm just going to read something that Tom wrote. He wrote this. It's the last. We, our book is full of guideposts, as you know, and the very last go, guidepost is a direct quotation from <clears throat> from Tom, and I think it sums it up very well. <clears throat> and he says, "Learning how to become a caregiver, how to truly care for another person's well-being, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, is a giant step forward." in the evolution of the human soul. And I think that just kind of sums it up. You know, when we light when we light our own path, our own dementia path, we aren't just lighting it for ourselves. We're lighting it for everyone. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's sometimes we forget that, you know, because as you say, there's so much going on and it's so exhausting. But, Every kindness we do, every loving thing that we do for the person we care for who has dementia, we do it for the world as well. So we need to keep that in mind and, you know, kind of celebrate ourselves yeah, for I, being, um, you know, taking this on. It's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a difficult, uh, difficult path. And if, if you'll indulge me as a grandmother, I just want to say one thing. <laughs> Out of the mouths of mouths of babes, right? Is it okay? Oh, sure. Very short story. Sure. sure. We have uh, uh, we have <clears throat> a granddaughter, Ellis, and she is she's five, and she has her older brother Thomas, who's seven, and Thomas is being uh, corrected by his parents, and his parents were saying, "Thomas, do you understand what we're saying?" And he wouldn't look at them, and he wouldn't respond. So finally, his little sister, in exasperation, said. <clears throat> Don't you understand he won't look at you because he's embarrassed? And then she said, you know, it's hard being a little kid, (laughs) and we're doing the best we can. (laughs) (laughs) So I was thinking, what wonderful lessons for caregivers, you know? She saw her brother's, uh, his body language, and she read it, I think, I think she read it correctly. So we need to look and try and really understand whether the person dementia is going through, even if they can't tell us. And then the second part of Ellis's wisdom is, hey, we're all doing the best we can. <laughs> yep, yep. And that's, and there'll always be another moment to, to do better, you know, to improve, that's right. to improve ourselves. That's right. That's um, right. So we have to not get stuck um, and beat ourselves up too much. No, know? not at all. No, we need to really honor the caregivers amongst us, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank you for indulging me in a grandchild story. Oh, oh no, no, that's they're they're precious. They're precious. So I'm a grandma mm-hmm. too. So I I totally get you that. know. Yeah. Um, well, it's too bad that uh, Tom was in an area that we weren't able to um, to have him. But he he added some light and laughter when he was here <laughs> for, for just a brief second. Um, but if people want to get a hold of of Tom and and um, Karen Brenner. You can reach them at t and k brenner at gmail dot com. That's t and then spell out and a n d k and then brenner b r e n n e r at gmail dot com. Mm-hmm. You, you can also find their book again um, called "You Say Goodbye, We Say Hello: The Montessori Method for Positive Dementia Care" on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble, and you can also get it on Kindle. And uh, you can follow them on Twitter at Brenner Pathways as well. Anything mm-hmm. else that you want to add as a last comment? Well, I tell you what, Lori, since Tom couldn't be with us this time, let's do it again and have him on, okay? Okay, what a deal. We can do that. You guys are always <laughs> always great fun. So thank you so okay. much for being with us. We really oh, appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And thank you for all the wonderful work you do. And God bless you. Okay, thank you. Tell, tell Tom uh, we'll do it again, okay? Okay. okay. Bye, Lori. Bye-bye. Um, for those of you have, who haven't listened to our last shows last week, you might want to uh, listen to those. All of our shows, are, of course, are archived 
Um, we had Patricia Conaway on, and it was titled, It's Time to Rethink Horseplay. And uh, that conversation was about what her horse taught her about dealing with her mother's dementia. It was, it was pretty enlightening. And we also had uh, a children's author on, Catherine Harrison, who wrote the book Weeds in Nana's Garden. Um, upcoming show this Friday, we'll have uh, Gary Joseph LeBlanc and Lisa Rodriguez on Alzheimer's and dementia behaviors in healthcare settings. We're going to talk about the new book that they've written. We also have coming up Reverend Colette Wood and uh, Dr. Jason Carthen and Mike Durison, where we're going to be talking about the NFL um, in the following week. So that'll be really interesting about concussions and things. This morning on Dementia Chats, we had a great conversation. I can't wait to get to edit um, this video and get it posted. But we talked about the importance of the influence of um, film media and what people's per um, perceptions were in terms of dealing with journalists and directors. And it was very interesting. Um, the one prior to that, we talked about dementia and anger, which again was also very good. In our next uh, Dementia Chats, which is a free webinar, will be June 28th. Um, on our last Conscious Caring resource video interview, we had um, dementia behavior specialist uh, Elon Caspi with us, and he, he uh, has a new project. He's been working on actually carving brains and um, wood brains, and he has one displayed at Yale. He was just commissioned to do another one um, as, um, as a gift for someone who is retiring. Pretty fascinating and how they are using these wood brains to help children interact. Um, our next Conscious Caring Resource um, interview is going to be with Claire Webster from Canada, and we're going to be talking about her, her um, coaching services to help families maneuver caring for a loved one, and she has been knee-deep in it with her own family, so she gets it. On the blog, you can find um, Healthline's um, 20 Best Top Blogs on Alzheimer's and Dementia, and I guess that is it until next time. So have a wonderful week, and we will talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget to share this episode. Bye now. Hi, everyone. This is Meredith from the Senior Fitness with Meredith podcast, where I discuss all things for seniors. From fitness, your health and wellness journeys, how to be all over strong and beyond. I also have my mini podcast called Motivation with Meredith. It's a great, quick, motivational pick-me-up for your days. Join me. Listen now. Search for Senior Fitness with Meredith on your favorite podcast platform.